Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us today. I hope you all know, or as you should know, the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland is a diverse group of lawyers and law students who are committed to the development of Black women in the legal profession. With our events and community service projects, we aim to serve the legal profession and the community. The Alliance operates to promote its members' professional growth and to raise awareness of the challenges unique to black women lawyers, to liaise with members of the Maryland Bar, and to provide community service designed to enhance the public's view of the legal profession. This year, we are here for the 2021 Legacy Luncheon. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines a legacy as a gift by will or something transmitted by or received from a predecessor or from the past. To the Alliance and the many black women who appeared, who worked for and appeared before Judge Mabel House Hubbard, she is our legacy. On June 8, 1981, almost 40 years ago, the face of the Maryland judiciary forever changed. This year, we honor the Honorable Mabel House Hubbard and her legacy as the first black woman appointed to a seat on the Maryland judiciary, to a seat on the bench. We honor Judge Hubbard and her conscious decisions to promote and support black women. We honor her opening a door and changing the face of the Maryland court when she took a seat at the table, or rather I should say a seat on the bench. She gave black women exposure to the court. She gave us a presence and a place. Judge Hubbard blazed a trail, not with the loudest voice, but with strength of character, grace, and perseverance. Many have said that Judge Hubbard would always say, it's not easy being green. But Judge Hubbard bore the weight of being a pioneer, the first, with style and dignity, and her words and her wisdom remain. It has been almost 15 years since Judge Hubbard passed away. But let me tell you, when we mention this event or mention plan the planning of this event, not one person, um, I don't know of one person who did not jump at the opportunity to help to talk about her or to support this event in some way. And that is what makes a legacy. To those who knew her, she was more than a judge. She was not a one dimensional character in a black robe. She was more than that. She was also a wife, a mother, a spiritual woman who held strong to her faith, a teacher, a delta, a friend, a listener and a lover of hats. She knew and understood the importance of her appointment to the bench. She did not want to be alone on the bench, but wanted to see other black women come with her and be with her and do what she had done. Judge Hubbard was a pioneer who led the way, but she was not the last. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak to Judge Holtstone, who reminded me that it was 10 years after Judge Hubbard's appointment to the District Court of Maryland before another black woman was appointed to the bench. And that got me to doing, I did a little research after that. And I also realized that it was 10 years after Judge Hubbard's appointment to the circuit court bench in 1985, before another black woman, Judge Dancy, Benita Dancy, was appointed to the bench in the circuit court for Baltimore City. Judge Hubbard was the original pioneer, trailblazer, torchbearer. She was the original triple OG. And we are all so thankful for her. Today we celebrate the first in Maryland, and some of our first on the bench and remind you that in 2021, we are still not finished looking for other firsts. There have been many firsts since her, but there are some firsts still waiting to happen across the state and this country. Our history requires it, our history demands it, our legacy requires it. Welcome to the 2021 Legacy Luncheon. I would like to now invite up Mr. Herb Jordan, on behalf of a member of Huber Memorial and ask him to give a few remarks. Welcome everyone. I too have not been in a suit in some number of years. Uh, my day job is a CIO for the state health department. It's about a $15 billion company and I've been at home in mostly sweatpants and t-shirts. So uh, good to see these things still fit. Uh, welcome to Huber Memorial Church. Uh, our pastor, uh, Reverend PM Smith was not able to be here today. Uh, I apologize, it was a last minute thing. Uh, he called me up, and so I'm going to do the best I can to substitute and fill in for him. But I know that uh, given who our honoree is, um, Judge Hubbard, and given that my pastor is also a graduate of University of, of, of Michigan Law School, 
And that I know the story he told me about, I asked him, why did you, why did you leave law? Which basically said my clients were getting guiltier and guiltier and younger and younger. And I thought I could do more intervention uh, from, the, from the pulpit uh, than, than what, the, what he did previously as in laws. But my point is he's brought those skills to preaching. And so the kind of reason that that brings and the kind of thinking and cause and effect has been priceless in terms of the body of Christ and the education that we've gotten here and the lives he's been in to change and transform because you get it just like we get it here. It's all about relationship or it's not about anything, right? And that tends to, that's why we have this gathering today of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland. And so I'm grateful that you guys can all be here. And um, let me just uh, quickly bring the invocation. I'll do a quick prayer so we all can kind of close our eyes and just look to the Lord and leave it just a moment. Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to gather before you. We thank you for all those gathered. We thank you for this organization, the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland. We're grateful for their presence here in this, and in this building. We thank you for having provided the means for them to have this gathering. And we know it's all about relationship. Be grateful in advance for the relationships that are going to come out of this. That'll be strengthened. That'll be stronger. We thank you for what they do how they labor in this field of justice. We speak about how important justice is and we'll be in your last days, God. And we thank you for these champions of that justice and what they'll do here today and what will come forth. We thank you for the woman they've chosen to honor and her history uh, and, and the things that she's done. We thank you, Lord, that as important as the Lord Jesus Christ is to us, those human examples are so important. We thank you for her human example and the example of everyone here and the lives that will be changed by how we live and how we act. We thank you, God, as it says in Amos, that, you know, it's, we worry about justice, we talk about justice, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream through everything that is said and occurs here this day. Bless this gathering. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Lizette Ringel Kirksey, a past president of Alliance. The Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland, Inc., annually gives a book scholarship to a deserving law student from the University of Baltimore School of Law and or University of Maryland Francis Carey School of Law. This year, in honor of Judge Hubbard, the scholarship has proudly been renamed the Judge Mabel House Hubbard Book Scholarship. The recipient will receive $500 and this year is funded by Glendora Hughes, a founding member of Alliance. Glendora's donation is in the name of her former law clerk and friend, Michelle Rett, who passed away from cancer. When asked, Glendora friends and family described Ms. Rett as follows. She was an attorney, writer, author, an entrepreneur, minister, motivational speaker, and educator. You name it, she did it. Michelle was always taking care of other people to a fault and thus neglected her own health. But this was her giving spirit. Thank you again, Glendora, for your generosity and the memory of your friend. Good morning. I am Patricia DeMeo, co-chair of the Judicial Nominating Committee for the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland. I am honored today to announce that the recipient of the first Judge Mabel House Hubbard Book Scholarship is Ms. Najma James. <laughs> Najma is a second year law student at the University of Maryland Francis Carey School of Law, where she is focusing on mediation and alternative dispute resolution. Najma is very active in her law school community as she currently serves as the vice president of the Black Law Students Association and the Entertainment Arts and Sports Lawyers Association. In the summer of 2020, Najma worked at the Maryland Office of the Attorney General in the Criminal Appeals Division. Subsequently, in the fall of 2020, Najma worked as a legal intern at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This spring, Najma served as a student attorney at the National Association for the Deaf Tackling Civil Rights Issues. Najma graduated magna cum laude from Pace University with her bachelor's in science degree in criminal justice and notably a double minor in sociology and computer science. 
While at Pace, Najma was a four-year excuse me, starter on the women's lacrosse team, a true definition of a student athlete. Please join me in congratulating Najma James, a brilliant future leader in our legal community. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. I am Judge Videtta Brown. I uh, am currently the immediate past president of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys. I am also one of the fabulous 35 that sit in the circuit court for Baltimore City. But most importantly for today, I am one of Judge Hubbard's law clerks. I was law clerk and I will say daughter number four with Judge Hubbard. And so it is my pleasure to be here to discuss with you all the reason that we're here. And I will say that the reason that we're here is somewhat bittersweet for me. And of course, we're here to honor the one and only fabulous Judge Mabel Evelyn Howes Hubbard because of her rise to the bench and being the only and the first black woman to rise to the bench in 1981. And honoring her is actually biblical. For the Bible tells us in Romans and I think 13 and somewhere around six or seven, that we are to give honor where honor is due. And it has been somewhat of a long time coming that we're giving this honor where, is it, where it is due. We owe honor to Judge Hubbard and respect to Judge Hubbard, certainly because she was the first black woman to be appointed to the bench in Maryland, but also we are honoring her because of what she meant to each of us individually and to what she meant to the legal profession collectively. That is the sweet part. The bitter part for me is, is that Judge Hubbard is not here to receive this honor. And I am only hoping that she is in that cloud of witnesses that I believe the Huber Memorial can attest to, that she is witnessing what it is that we're laying at her feet today. When I'm asked about my thoughts about what or how Judge Hubbard's rise to the bench and her being the only black woman impacted me, being the only black woman on the bench impacted me. And what I find interesting about that thought is, is that we assess our lives by looking backwards, not by looking forward. So for example, today is May 1st, and we will not understand the impact of May 1st until sense of really who I was working for. I just knew that I was glad to one, have a job, and number two, that this nice woman took me under her wings, this smart, studious, this incredible black woman took me under her wings, basically from my mother's arms right into hers. And so I knew it then, but I wish that I knew what I know today, back in 1988 when I clerked for Judge Hubbard, and perhaps I would have handled the clerkship a little bit differently. Maybe I would have walked a little taller. Maybe I would have spoken a little louder. Maybe my back would have straightened out when someone came into the courtroom, but I didn't know what greatness that I was among when I was among it because I couldn't look back. I, could, I was only in that moment. And I think that all of Judge Hubbard's law clerks, and there are a number of them who are present either virtually or here in person, that we knew that we were working for someone unique. Judge Hubbard was a hard worker. Judge Hubbard was one who loved her family. She shared with us her two sons and her husband. Those three men worshiped the ground that Judge Hubbard walked on. And that was good for us as black women to see that. And she didn't hesitate to share it with us. But we were grateful to have been chosen by her. I cannot tell you when I was a law clerk how often and how frequent young black women flooded in and out of Judge Hubbard's chambers, seeking her advice, seeking her guidance. She was the perfect role model for anyone who wished to have one. She was the perfect mentor. She never turned anybody away. And as her law clerk, 
I tell you, sometimes you, they would show up, it would be at 445. And I'm like, y'all really got to go home now because I want to go home. But because we were her law clerk, you could not leave. Judge Hubbard worked hard and her favorite scripture, and I believe I have this right, that it is John 9 and 4, that says that I must work the works of him who has sent me while it is still day, for the night comes when no man can work. And again, the law clerks and also Debbie Bryce, who was her administrative assistant, can tell you that we worked oftentimes way into the night. Because although Judge Hubbard was very deliberate about her work, she was very measured in her work, she wasn't always fast. <laughs> and so oftentimes the night would cometh and would still find us working. Many people um, felt about her, I think the way that I felt about her. And there are some people who obviously knew her longer than I knew her. Some people who knew her in different ways, they knew her as a colleague, they knew her as a um, friend, they knew her as a parent. And those persons are gonna be featured on this video that we're about to show you, where people have taken the time to reflect back, to talk about what their, the impact of her presence was on their lives. Enjoy it. I am pleased to join the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys and the many who admire and wish her well in celebrating the life and highlighting the legacy of the Honorable Mabel Howells Hubbard. Hers was a life well and usefully lived, and therefore one worthy of spotlighting and emulation. Tess Hubbard was a pioneer, a trailblazer, that, however, is not alone the basis for this recognition. She was, more to the point, a trailblazer, a pioneer with purpose. She viewed her trailblazing not in personal terms, but through a societal lens as opening there to foreclose opportunities. To that end, she took it as her responsibility as did the elder in the Will Allen Drum Gould poem, Now Then Shall We Build, to anticipate and overcome the obstacles and pitfalls that could perplex and derail those who followed her, especially young African-American women. Judge Hubbard was, in short, a bridge builder whose impact will long endure. She discussed this with us, uh, said, you know, if she became a judge, that she would be the first and only black woman judge in Maryland. And, you know, as a young person, that really didn't set in. But, you know, the more that I became accustomed to it, because I remember when it happened, okay, it's something that you actually have to take in. Um, I think she knew that she would be under a large microscope. Uh, that she was going to be somebody that a lot of people put up against other people. And when I say that, it's, it's just a reality, you know. Um, she was in the newspapers, you know. She was around everybody. Uh, she was very active in the community. Uh, you know, the Deltas, you know, she was, a, she was a Delta, so they were very much like, you know, oh, great, this is a great thing. And it was, uh, but it was really a community thing. Uh, my mother was very, I don't want to say popular, but she had relationships with people that just really were really strong. And so for her, it was not just herself doing that, but she really did think of herself as bringing the community up to where she could actually represent a lot of people, a lot of different voices, a lot of different you know, opinions. And Mabel, in the words of um, that famous song made by Nat King Cole, was unforgettable. 
Uh, I first met Mabel in 1972 as a third year law student at the University of Maryland School of Law. She was in the entering uh, first year class and uh, immediately was an interesting person because Mabel was at least 10 years older than most of the other students at the school at that time. And matter of fact, we quickly nicknamed her Mother Hubbard, which she claimed and that was fine with her. Um, and Mabel uh, was active in the Black American Lawsuits Association, BALSA, but we consider her to be the conscience of BALSA. Uh, us younger students would come up with such ideas as we were going to, in protest to the school's policies, we were going to chain ourselves to the school with, uh, and make sure that no one could get into school and part of our protests. And we, we would discuss this in our BALSA meetings. And then at the end, we would turn to Mabel and say, well, Mabel, what do you think? And Mabel would, would think for a minute, looking at it, she said, I don't think that's such a good idea. The next time I saw Mabel was, uh, I had time to, a uh, chance to deal with her uh, up close and personal was in 1985, when she was the last judge to join the seven sitting judges campaign um, for the election in 1986. Um, Mabel had been a judge on the district court for about four or five years at that point, And Mabel really did not want to leave the district court. She was a people person. The district court was a people's court. And she came to the circuit court as a candidate only because she was encouraged to, and we needed her to round out the ticket of um, three black judges and four whites. She was, um, she, she did it, but she really loved the district court. So she came to the circuit court and we became the seven sitting judges. She was a wonderful colleague. She was a generous colleague. She was um, serious about her work. I think she was always serious about the many, many different, um, you know, her discipline was very similar to mine. She had been a teacher and I had been a teacher. And um, we felt like we had a lot in common. But um, on the bench, she she was she took the cases seriously. She was respectful to litigants. I I didn't sit in her courtroom, but, but I did appear before her when she was a, um, a what was then called a master in chancery, and um, I I she was always respectful, um, and I think she she cared a lot. She, and she had great instincts about human nature. Uh, I think that because, you know, she was a teacher, she was a social worker, she was in the law. Um, she just really uh, understood people a lot. And um, I think dealt with people firmly, but kindly. I have described this phenomenal woman as the notorious MHH. We comparing her to the notorious RBG, Ruth Bay Ginsburg. Now I did that for, I've done that for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, I became the fifth black judge on the circuit court for Baltimore City. So it, we took a photo and in talking with Mabel about that photo, she said, you know, I never wanted to be the only one. I was pleased when there was another one. She said, and I'm, I'm happy that there are five of us, but that's not enough. There should be more. We need more women judges. We need more black women judges, especially in this city in this state. So that that was Mabel. She wanted more just like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She welcomed each and every woman judge, especially the black ones who came on the bench. She offered her assistance. She mentored us. She talked with us. When I was a prosecutor, well, actually, when I started as a law clerk, she was the only black female judge on the bench. So I was very much aware of her presence here in the circuit court. And then when I became a prosecutor, it became even a larger awareness for me because I would have to appear in front of her, which was always a blessing, but it was also a little bit of a curse. And let me tell you why. Naturally, like any other uh, lawyer, you wanna be prepared, 
you you know you want to look your best you want to be your best you want to be prepared for the jury you want to know your case you want to be ready well for me and i think it's safe to say for most of the other uh black women lawyers appearing before judge hubbard kind of added a little something to that because you wanted to look your extra best you know, you wanted to be the best you you could be um, because you knew she was the only Black woman there and that she represented, you know, all of us. So in a sense, you kind of felt like, oh, my God, I got to make sure I make a good impression on her. I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to embarrass myself. You know, we represent the whole race. Y you know, you kind of had that feeling a little bit. So it was like, um, you took that extra effort to make sure, you know, the shoes matched the outfit. I mean, little things that really you never thought about that weren't important as, as a lawyer became a little more important because now you were a black woman lawyer going in front of a black woman judge. And, you know, it was like going before royalty almost and you wanted to make sure you made that good impression, not just as a good prosecutor or lawyer, but as a fine, upstanding Black woman. Word measured. Judge Hubbard was measured in every single way. She was measured in her thoughts. She was steady in not only her speech, but her actions. She was deliberate and measured, even in the way she walked. So there was nothing that was rushed about her. There was nothing that she, but that was haphazard about Judge Hubbard. She did everything in a measured way. And that is my best description of Judge Hubbard. She was much more than, you know, a judge. Uh, they, they used to call her Mother Hubbard. And so she was that. She was fully that if you needed her to be. But she, she was always cloaked in the robe. So there was some way she was able to work that dichotomy. She was open to advise and guide, but she was still the Honorable Mabel House Hubbard. Judge Hubbard was a Christian. She was a Proverbs 31 woman, a wife of noble character. She was a mother. She was a friend to those who knew her. She was compassionate, had great empathy for those who sat on the other side of the bench. Judge Hubbard was a great cook, and she loved wearing hats but she was very classy, she was sharp, and she knew how to wear a hat better than anyone I think I've ever seen. Um, she was witty and funny, with an amazing smile and laugh. She wasn't conceited, but she knew she was special since she was the first black female appointed to any bench in the state of Maryland. And she used to say to me, it's not easy being green. And what she meant by that is that she knew that she was the example for any and all future Black female attorneys and judges that were following her footsteps. Wonderfully, her voice was so melodic. I mean, it was so, it was like when she spoke, it was like she sang. And I'll always remember that, but the words were never misunderstood. You never misunderstood her words. She was always very clear. We first met Mabel. Mabel was regal. She was regal without pretensions. Um, and that brings me to the story of uh, during the campaign in 1986, we were all riding around in uh, Judge David Mitchell's Judge Mobile, seven judges packed into the station wagon. And lo and behold, one night the station wagon broke down. We were on our way to some high school in East Baltimore to speak to a group of folks. And the station wagon broke down, was smoking on the side of the road. And 
police officer came by and said, you know, recognize some of us and said, do you need some help? And we said, we have to get to this meeting and our cars broke down. Well, 10 minutes later, a paddy wagon arrived at the scene and offered us free transportation to our campaign site. Judge Hubbard and Judge Friedman really weren't feeling it. I mean, these two ladies, uh, as Judge Friedman said later, um, the optics just weren't good of these two ladies climbing out of this paddy wagon. Um, but Judge Hubbard was, Judge Friedman was reluctant. Judge Hubbard had to be coaxed into getting into this paddy wagon, which she eventually did, but we remember that for a long time and laughed about it as that she was really not feeling that, but she was a team player. When I was interviewed, I remember she said a couple things that I thought, uh, I just liked her spirit. Uh, one of the things she first said, she said, uh, it's very important that you get along with my secretary. I adore my secretary. So I have to have peace with my staff. And that was fine with me. I try to approach life in a peaceful manner. Then another thing I thought was wonderful, she said was, if I'm on the bench, if my family calls, I need to know immediately because my family, they don't, they rarely call. And I thought that was important because she understood her priorities and obviously her family was critical to her. So uh, I appreciate that. And then as I got to know a little bit more, I learned about her faith and that was really important to her. My memories of Judge Hubbard on the bench, um, she was a person who commanded respect and authority in her courtroom, uh, but did it without uh, raising her voice or banging the gavel. Um, she did it with such grace and poise. Um, that's that's one one big thing. And she was articulate. And she, I think, perhaps maybe ran her courtroom like a classroom. She was going to instruct you uh, on how things should be done. And she would have nothing less than your best. Judge Hubbard uh, ran her courtroom with efficiency, uh, but she was also really funny. I don't know if, if folks know that about her. She had a fantastic sense of humor. And we um, had a lot of moments of levity and just enjoyed the time spent there. She was very close with the people who worked in the courtroom. She was particularly um, giving of her time with the law clerks. She had great relationships with the sheriffs, with the probation uh, department that was just down the hall. And uh, especially the court stenographers, which um, we just had a good a good working relationship, and and it was just a, a very pleasant place to come to work every day. Because I worked in the courthouse with my mother for I think three or four years. I may be exaggerating. I did get a chance to see her work a lot, um, and I think. My favorite memories are just seeing her, not so much on the bench, but how she interacted with everyone within the courthouse and in the courthouse system, how she was very respectful to everyone. And when I say everyone, everybody that worked in that, the courthouse, she would talk to. She had a relationship with them all. So I'm talking about everyone from the, from the sheriff at the door, you know, to the woman who may come in after work where everybody's kind of just emptying out the trash. She, she would know all of these people, everyone, lawyers, you know, every, everybody. So anybody who kind of worked in the building that she actually would come across, she would try to build a relationship with them. On a personal basis, I'm extremely grateful for Judge Hubbard's service and for the standard that she set in the legal profession. Judge Hubbard served with grace and humility but I always had the sense when I appeared before her that she was well aware of her position in history and that she sought to live up to that position and to serve as a role model 
for the African-American women who would come behind her in the judiciary and the legal profession. And I'm very, very grateful for her thoughtfulness and for her having led the way. And she was just a role model, as was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, to young lawyers, aspiring them to reach higher heights. And I'd like to think that each of us represented a piece of Judge Hubbard's personality. Now, now, what piece do I represent? I don't know. People used to say, are you related to Judge Hubbard? You seem a lot like her. You even look like her. And, uh, <laughs> and she, she used to treat me like a daughter. As a matter of fact, she treated us all like daughters. We were the daughters, actually. She would always say, we were the daughters that she never had. And so she made sure to take care of us to, and she corrected us when we were wrong. Trust me. <laughs> it was very uh, exciting to be around her. I learned tremendously from her. And I enjoyed in particular uh, when she would give various rulings that she took her time in explaining why she made the decision that she did so that any defendant or any litigant understood uh, what occurred and that they weren't, they weren't confused. If you look at or talk to anyone who has been in her realm of influence, her students, uh, co-workers, secretary, law clerk, fellow judges, attorneys who appeared before her, we all hold a piece of her in us. We are her legacy. How we strive, how we perform, how we, uh, while our route to whatever career we, ch we choose may not be straight, um, we continue to press on. The way that it immediately impacted my life when I, that clerking for her impacted my life after I'd finished clerking for, for her was the incredible but not burdensome responsibility that I had to make sure that I made her proud. I knew that I would be uh, working in Baltimore City and appearing in front of her colleagues and everybody knew I was her law clerk. And so it was important for me to have my A game always. And so when I came to the courtroom that I was prepared because that's what she taught me to be. I was um, measured in my speech and in the way in which I prepared cases. And I was also always ready to assist the court because I believe that once you're a law clerk, always a law clerk. And so um, that was how she impacted me initially. Now, as life moves on, obviously, the impact matures because you mature. And I do wish that I sort of appreciated who Judge Hubbard was at the time that life was moving on. I think we look at life backwards to see how things impacted us. But I wish I sort of knew the importance of who she was and what she meant, not only to the community, but, but, to, but to the profession at the time, because then I would have paid much more attention to what it was that Judge Hubbard was actually teaching. Well, one of, one of my most memorable experiences uh, with Judge Hubbard uh, was my first day as her law clerk. And of course, I got there early. I arrived before her and her secretary, Debbie, got me situated. And uh, when she came in, I jumped up and I extended my hand to shake hers and Judge Hubbard opened her arms to greet me. And um, that defines Judge Hubbard. I graduated from law school in 1991 and I got a job working for Judge Hubbard that the um, you know, the next year, and I was supposed to just go on to be a lawyer or something after that year that you worked for the, that you clerked for the judge, Judge Hubbard was like, oh no, I'm not going to let you go. You must stay another year. I was like, 
I walked into her chambers already um, passing the bar. I was ready to go on and be a lawyer. And she was like, no, you're not going to do that. She said you were her favorite, right? Yeah, I mean, she was clear that I wasn't going to go anywhere. And I will tell you, she was in Chambers 329. And I I love being there. And I, I love being a part of what Judge Hubbard was to everybody. She just commanded respect. Um, in a way that the person that was listening to it still felt valued. Um, and that is something that I thought was very unique. Um, and, and, you know, she, she was a parent as well, a mother. So she was able to uh, influence younger people that came into her courtroom and give them words of wisdom. So all of those uh, memories are with me um, with regard to my time there. So, she had a significant impact on me because I was her last law clerk, but this was the beginning of my legal career. So it was just an amazing opportunity to, to work with her. Um, she taught me the importance of humanity in everyone because some days I thought she was a little bit too lenient, but she saw everyone as a human being and she treated them accordingly. Um, if you wronged her, she would handle it. She would handle you, but she didn't come out the gate that way. She was she was just able to to deal with each person individually. But um, as a young person, and knowing her significance in the legal profession, the judicial profession, I was like at her feet. I was there to learn from her. And she taught me um, not only how to pre treat people with humanity, she taught me great humility. There were a, co there were a collection of moments that I treasured with her the most. And I think it was when she issued her Hubbardisms from the bench. Uh, and those were a collective group of sayings, like, um, if that's true, there's not a dog in Georgia, even iron wears out. I mean, those statements um, were issued with love and care for the most part, uh, sometimes during sentencing, sometimes when uh, folks came before her that she'd seen before. Uh, but she didn't hesitate to uh, share her wisdom with everyone who came through her courtroom. The, when Judge Hubbard retired, I decided to write some Hubbardisms, and they were just favorite sayings that Judge Hubbard had said. But more... More importantly, they were the kind of sayings everybody remembered her to say. And I just, and I remember I typed up on the computer a bunch of those sayings we used when she retired. And I always thought it was funny when she, when people would like say them, it's like, your mother had these great sayings and I always thought they were weird. Okay, they were just strange. But, you know, I always thought that the one thing my mother had was this command of the English language, and she could write and she could speak like I, nobody else. So, I mean, she was a great orator. She was just somebody who would talk and you would listen to her and you would think, oh my gosh, that's just so profound. Um, but then she told me one day that she got a lot of these things from her uncle. And she was like, you know, she she thought that he probably was the smartest person she'd ever met uh, just because of the way he would read and read and read. And he would have all these sayings. So it's so funny. Sometimes people are like, you know, she came up with these sayings. She was like, I didn't really come up with them. It's, you know, my uncle, my uncle came up with them, but I just said it. But I think, you know, 
all of everything that people have heard in court and they always quote, uh, yeah, I heard my entire life with my mother. There is something that everybody brings to the table, but it's how we choose to share what we have with others. So she always believed that everybody has some gifts with them that they can share with each other. It's just how we choose to share them. And really it's that whole relationship. I think her legacy is, I don't wanna say excellence because I don't want everybody to try to be excellent in the best that they can do. But I think what she did was bring her best self every time she left the house. And one thing she would wanna do is build relationships with people and have that as one of her legacies, you know? It's that building relationships, um, treating each other with dignity, with respect. I really admired her in so many ways. I'm trying not to cry. In so many ways, I wanted to uh, emulate her, be like her, because she had so much um, strength and so much. She was, I always told her that she, you were just so professional. I mean, she never looked down on people. She was always extending a helping hand. And I just, I just admire her. She always, like I said earlier, gave great, strong advice. If you listen. Her legacy are the, are the, are all of the women that she made a point to hire. I mean, I remember that, that she, her, her, she wanted to bring more, expose more African-American females to the bench so that they would have that opportunity, um, an opportunity that we weren't once given uh, in the past. And so she made it a point to bring on as many African-American females to experience um, the bench in the courtroom so that you know we may ascend to that position as well, and some, and some have. Reaching back and bringing along. She, she encouraged Black women in particular, Black women lawyers, uh, it, it, just to be the best they could be at their craft, uh, to be civil, to be professional, and to not shy away from taking a chance on a higher position. And she was always happy to see when law lawyers she had known become judges, judges she'd known maybe get a, a elevation she was extremely excited when I became administrative judge. And that was in uh, 2008, I guess. I have to keep track. Three, 2003, because it was three years before she retired. And so I have pictures of her at my investiture. And she was like beaming like that, you know, like that favorite aunt that she was so excited um, that finally in her, in her mind, and she told me, she said, you know, we still need more black women judges, but you have cracked another bar because there was never a, a an African a woman, African American woman administrative judge in the state of Maryland before me, and she was very proud of that, and she bragged on it a little. So, um, but she would continuously, even after she left the bench, uh, we we would chat sometimes, and she always would ask how things were going in court, she, but she'd also ask, "How are you doing?" How are you handling this? And she would always say, look, do not let them beat you down. Don't, you have the power, you have the power to do good and to do the right thing and use that power and do not let them deter you. I think Judge Hubbard's legacy to the judiciary is that she changed the face of the Maryland courts and she ensured equal justice under law for all of our citizens. Here comes the judge with style and grace and intelligence as well. Fairness and justice were innate as far as I could tell. She did everything with a judicial but yet a personal touch. 
This is why when we think of her, we miss her very much. She always loved her family more than anything. She selflessly adopted us into that loving ring. Intern after intern, clerk after clerk, there may be nine or 10 whose souls were touched and changed by clerking with her back then. The Honorable Mabel House Hubbard, she now smiles down from up above and she has left a lasting legacy of leadership, justice, and love. And I first met Mabel Hubbard and Miss Hubbard and the judge Hubbard in a kind of awkward way. Um, I was practicing for moot court in 1973, and she peeped her head in the moot courtroom and said, you can do better than that. <laughs> I thought I was doing pretty good. And I didn't know, I knew her, but I did not know her. I had never really had a conversation with her. She said, you can do better than that. As a matter of fact, I believe that you can make the moot court board. I hadn't even thought about a moot court board. I was just trying to pass. <laughs> but then I found out that she had been the first African-American woman at the University of Maryland on the moot court board. And she told me that. And she said, you will be the first African-American man on the moot court board. And day after day, Pat, she worked with me. She uh, showed me why I was so bad. <laughs> but then she made me good. But isn't that what she was all about? She was a bridge builder and a visionary. If anybody would look at her history, you'll understand that she was at one time a teacher, then came home to take care of her children, and then went back to school and eventually became a lawyer. The reason why I said that she was a visionary and a dreamer and a dreamer who dared to dream is because there are a whole lot of people that go through their entire lives knowing that they need to change course but never change. There are some sitting in here right now. So she was, first of all, a dreamer, and she followed her dream. But then she was a woman who could see the good in you and pull it out of you. And she did it over and over and over again. I, 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 when I would go into a courtroom, I didn't know who I was going to get. Because a lot of times, Judge Hubbard would spend lengthy periods of time telling my clients how to dress, how to act, how to treat their wives. And I was just like a spectator on the sideline. But the thing that impressed me so much is that she took her, judge as, her, her job as a judge to a higher level. She realized that she only had a moment with that person and she may never see them again, but she wanted to make sure that whatever she did in that moment, that it would last them for a lifetime and hopefully put them on a positive path. And so she was indeed a visionary and she was indeed a caring woman. And perhaps she'll go down in history as one who touched the future. Silence is a quiet, and it feels like it's a getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we would take the world to its feet. Move, but I won't take, bring it to its feet. Move, I won't take.
we have each other and for that we have each other That was so incredibly beautiful, <laughs> incredibly beautiful. Um, thank you to President Wilson and to Dennis Vice for putting that together. Um, you made me even sound like I could put two sentences together, so I don't know how you did it, but thank you so much for that. I would take a personal moment, if you don't mind, to just say in the open that Judge Hubbard loved Huber Memorial. This was her home. And even though the home at the time was the uh, tabernacle that you had over on York Road, and she would be extremely proud that you all have landed here on this piece of land. But she really did love this church where I believe she taught Sunday school and she participated. She didn't come and just sit in the pews. She came and she was actually a member of this church in every sense of the word. Also, I would like to hope and think that Judge Hubbard is proud of who I became. I, I, I really do want that to be true, even though um, I have to concede to Senator Gladden that I think she might have been Judge Hubbard's favorite. <laughs> because, you know, she hired August to August, and every August she would boot you out of that door, whether you had somewhere to go or not. But for some reason, Senator Gladden was able to stay. And um, I think that's because Senator Gladden just kept Judge Hubbard young and kept her laughing. And so I appreciate that. But as I, earlier, as I said, May 1st is in a couple of hours going to be over. We'll be on to May 2nd. And we have honored Judge Hubbard today. And the question in my mind is, how do you keep that going? How, you know, do we just honor her today and just kind of tomorrow start doing things the way we normally did it? But I do know that, and I got this from a movie, that that which is remembered lives. That which is remembered lives. And how is it that we can carry this memory? I don't know where the camera just went because I'm not in the pulpit. There you go. Um, how do we do this? How do we continue this momentum and the way that we honor Judge Hubbard? I was taught long time ago that every black woman's responsibility, and I think Judge Hubbard understood this too, was that if you were special at all, if there's anything about you that was special or anything way in which you were gifted, no matter what it was, is that you were to find seven other black women and you were to deposit that in her. Seven women, you would deposit your skill, what you know. You would deposit your personality if you have to. You would deposit your way of thinking. You would deposit the best of you in seven other women. And I challenge everybody to do that. Every black woman that's here and represented today, find your seven. 
Um, I was lucky to find seven when I was um, in the state's attorney's office. I found seven and God has blessed me enough to continue with seven more because I have seven law clerks. And I just hope that there is something that I have deposited in those women that I got from Judge Hubbard. Because as someone said in the video, she, there was a piece of us that she saw when she hired us that I think reflected who she was. And she continued that with us. One other way that we're going to continue to honor Judge Hubbard is, is that the committee has decided and it will so let it be written and so let it be done that the legacy luncheon will now be called the Judge Mabel House Hubbard Legacy Luncheon. Thank you for the alliance. Thank you. Uh, so when we started planning, the Legacy Luncheon Committee started planning this event, we had um, several asks that we, we did around town, around the world. And um, we specifically went to Judge Hubbard's other home, her courthouse home. And we had a specific ask regarding her portrait and where we wanted it and would like it to be hung at the courthouse. And so I'm now going to turn to the wonders of technology because we moved this event from the courthouse to Huber Memorial. We pre-recorded some remarks um, that Judge Mays uh, did a special presentation at Huber Memorial. So I'd like to turn our attention to that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present to you this portrait of the Honorable Mabel Powell's Hubbard. This portrait was originally dedicated and unveiled in March of 2013 during a joint meeting of the term of court for the Circuit Court for Baltimore City, the Bar Association for Baltimore City, and the Courthouse and Law Museum Foundations. And it was done right here in the ceremonial courtroom, room 400 of the Clarence M. Mitchell Jr. Courthouse. And you'll have to forgive me, but I just, it's very hard for me to take my eyes off of this portrait because it's just so beautiful. This portrait was created by Semi Knotts, world renowned at this point. He's the first black man to be commissioned as an artist to prepare a presidential, official presidential portrait, that of William Jefferson Clinton, President and First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. That was unveiled in June of 2004, and it hangs now at the White House. Semi Knox has been commissioned by everyone from the United States Supreme Court Justices, uh, the first Black Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, to United States uh, Cabinet members, the first Black Attorney General, Eric Holder, and even our first Black multi-billionaire, Oprah Winfrey. And he's also been commissioned by even our local Maryland luminaries, our very young, the first black chief judge of the Court of Appeals, Robert M. Bell. Mr. Knox's portraits are oil-based on oil-soaked linen. This portrait of Judge Hubbard, as you can see, in addition to being extraordinarily beautiful, I can probably take my eyes off of it, it shows her character, her strength her spirit of the person that she really was. Judge Hubbard is the first black woman judge to have her portrait commissioned by the Courthouse Foundation. And that was in an effort to um, expose, to give exposure to African-American judges to the Baltimore City community. I am certain, although she is the first, that there will be many more to come. And just so to be clear, and so that everyone understands, Judge Hubbard's portrait will now hang in the ceremonial courtroom of the Clarence Mitchell Court, Jr. Courthouse. Um, and so she will be the first black woman to hang, have her portrait hung in that courtroom. I've been looking forward all afternoon, so it's good to see all of your faces. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Williams, and I am a member at large with the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland, and also a committee member for this event. I thank you for attending today. I come before you today to show you something very special. 
One of the ways that the Alliance chose to honor the life and legacy of the Honorable Mabel House Hubbard was to commission a commemorative plaque. And this plaque was commissioned to be mounted in the courthouse, Elijah E. Cummings Courthouse, in front of her original courtroom, or the courtroom where she spent most of her career when she sat in the circuit court for Baltimore City, room 329. So at this time, we're going to unveil the plaque to see. Isn't it so beautiful? And the plaque reads, the original courtroom of the Honorable Mabel Howes Hubbard, the first black woman to be appointed to any bench in the state of Maryland. Having received her Juris Doctor degree at the University of Maryland School of Law in 1975, Judge Hubbard was appointed Master in Chancery for the Supreme Bench of Baltimore City in 1978. She was the first female lawyer to hold this position. In further recognition of her legal acumen and her reputation for fairness, Governor Harry Hughes appointed her as an associate judge to the District Court of Maryland, Baltimore City in 1981, making her the first black woman appointed to the judiciary. In 1985, she again made history as the first black woman to be appointed as an associate judge to the circuit court for Baltimore City, where she served until 1999. Prior to her service as a jurist, Judge Hubbard was a dedicated educator in Philadelphia and Baltimore. A native of Mount Clemens, Michigan, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in 1958 from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and completed postgraduate work at the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Pennsylvania. A role model and mentor to many, Judge Hubbard encouraged and supported the career advancement of black women attorneys. She was known for her steady judicial temperament, her masterful command of the English language, and her witty Hubbardisms. Presented by the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland Incorporated, in celebration of the 40th anniversary of her appointment. Our history requires it, our legacy demands it. So I'm gonna go a little off script, um, just a little bit, and take a moment um, while we're honoring Judge Hubbard to invite my sister in the law, Alicia Wilson, uh, I'm the taller sister, uh, up to the podium to say a few remarks on behalf of Mayor Brandon M. Scott. Good afternoon. I'm Alicia Wilson. I'm a past president of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys, and I really counted a blessing to be here today. Um, as Judge, uh, Judge um, Brown said to us in the beginning, um, we really are fulfilling God's command and giving honor where honor is due. And so it is an honor to be able to read this letter from Br um, Mayor Brandon Scott. Dear Alicia and the members of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland, it is my honor to write to you today in response to your letter from March 3rd, 2021. I would like to sincerely thank you for inviting me to make a small contribution in your broader and much deserved efforts to celebrate the life and legacy of Judge Mabel House Hubbard, the first black woman appointed to the judiciary in the state of Maryland. It would be my distinct honor to introduce an ordinance to the Baltimore City Council to rename the District Courthouse on Fayette Street as the District Court for Baltimore City, Mabel House Hubbard Courthouse. I look forward to working alongside the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland to accomplish this important step and hope to join you in further celebrations of Judge Hubbard on the 40th anniversary of her judicial appointment. Sincerely, Mayor Brandon M. Scott, Mayor of Baltimore. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Alicia, for bringing those remarks on behalf of the mayor. We are so, so honored and so blessed and so thankful um, for, for the mayor, for this church, for this program, for all of you. It's just been a blessing and a, and a joyful journey. So I, I could not, um, I have to pause for a moment and take a breath and just um, just thank you. We've, we've worked so hard. This committee has worked so hard to put this together and has asked and called on so many of our friends and, and family to help with this. And so this is truly a blessing. Um, at this time, I'm now going to go back on program and um, I would like to turn virtually the microphone over to Mr. John A. Hubbard, uh, Mabel, Judge Mabel House Hubbard's son, to give okay. some remarks on behalf of the family. Uh, first of all, I definitely am uh, totally blown away by what I just heard and what I've witnessed today. Uh, I do want to say on just behalf of our, my family, uh, the Hubbard family, uh, thank you to everyone that's actually put this together. Uh, this is something that is really, uh, really just, it's, it's overwhelming, uh, very much so. I do appreciate everything and all the work that everyone has done um, and the way that everybody that has spoke about my mother, uh, I truly appreciate it. My family truly appreciates it. Uh, I do know that my mother was a wonderful person. Uh, I do not want to usually brag, but I think after today, you guys have given me bragging rights, and I do thank you for that also. But one thing we want to do is just, uh, I appreciate this legacy most much in uh, the Alliance. Thank you so very much. Uh, and not so much for me, but really for the legacy, such as like, especially I'm sitting here watching it with my daughter. Her name is Phoebe and Evelyn Hubbard. Uh, she might even go on to say hello. She might wave for a second. That's her right there. And she is five years old. And just to know, she really got a chance to learn about her grandmother today. And she's watching us and learning. And it's just something out of a, 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 just a moment of pride. So for my family, we really do appreciate and thank everyone that's put this together. Everyone that's contributed to uh, the video, uh, the, the tribute. It was just, it's over, it's, it's overwhelming in such a great way. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank uh, John Hubbard for, um, and the Hubbard family for sharing, again, sharing his mother with us, all of us um, who knew her and who had the opportunity to work with her. Um, because I think the one thing, I, I think I said in the beginning, the one thing that came through is that anyone who knew or worked with Judge Hubbard wanted to be a part of this event and um, be a part. When we walked into Huber Memorial Church a few weeks ago, I um, was, we were talking about there was gonna be an event for Judge Hubbard here. And the ladies at the desk started talking about, I, we remember Judge Hubbard and telling stories about her. So to know her was to, I think, truly be in the presence of someone, a true legend. legend and we appreciate her legacy. I'm now going to return um, to the virtual world. And I would like to um, ask Judge Audrey Carrion, who is the chief judge and the administrative judge for the Circuit Court for Baltimore City. And I want to say, first of all, we thank the Circuit Court for Baltimore City for allowing us to um, mount the plaque and also for moving Judge Hubbard's portrait to room 400. And I'd like to turn it over to Judge Carrion for remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. What a wonderful day and what a wonderful event. Uh, President Wilson McClawn, members and officers of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland, members of Judge Hubbard's fa family, especially Evelyn, we're so happy that you are watching this event. Uh, members of the Huber Memorial Church, colleagues, I am so pleased to see uh, retired Chief Judge Bell here, as well as Judge Watts, and our former administrative judge, Judge Holland, uh, dear friends, I am honored uh, to address you on behalf of the Circuit Court for Baltimore City, Judge Hubbard's judicial home from 1985 to 1999. We celebrate the 40th anniversary of her appointment as a jurist. 
the rededication of her portrait and the placement of a beautiful plaque outside of the courtroom she served in for most of her years is more than an assemblage of tangibles. Her life is a lesson of inclusion, a lesson in and a commitment to be an ideal society in which everyone has stake and which all are invited to participate and be committed. She was an accomplished jurist, a clever mentor, and a masterful example. We are better lawyers, judges, and frankly, better human beings for have known her and worked with her. It is traditional in our court for each active judge to have provisional guardianship of a numbered part within our court. Judge Hubbard's part was part 23. Upon her retirement in August of 1999, she confided the charge of watching over part 23 to me. Those have been big shoes to fill. She spoke at my investiture, which as many of you know, is our installation ceremony as a judge. Weeks before my investiture, I met Judge Hubbard in her chambers and we covered many topics, including the shared experience of being first. As you know, she was the first black woman appointed to the judiciary in the state of Maryland. I was the first Latina. I will never forget our get together. We both recognize that being first at something can be daunting and intimidating. You are going somewhere with no guard and finding yourself. Your friends, mentors, family, community expects a lot from you. Obstacles, she said, will always be present. People will always say you were first appointed because you were a woman or because you were black or because you were Latina. But she continued by expressing that one's actions and the type of judge or colleague you become will outweigh those obstacles. Those obstacles should not be seen, I, heard, I learned from her that day, as challenges, but as motivators for success. As a first, Judge Harvard carried within her high expectations and faced unique challenges. She has forced a pathway for others like me. As a young, bright-eyed judge, she encouraged us to do things beyond those we have already accomplished. During our talk, Judge Hubbard reminded me that as judges, our role is not to please others, but to value and remember what the law stands for. Yes, we should demand more of ourselves as well as of the judiciary. We cannot change everything at once, but if we choose to work hard, work together, set an example, progress will come. Judge Hubbard would be proud to witness the diversity in the legal profession that so many of you present today have added to. She understood that she was first, but not finished. I know that we resolve here today to continue building upon her legacy. I am especially grateful for the support she gave me that day in 1999, the warmth of her reception, her encouragement, and her commitment and passion to help others. I thank you again for the invitation to join you today. This has been an exceptional moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Carrion uh, and um, the courthouse family, Judge Hubbard's courthouse family. I do want to also let you all know, and you should have received it accidentally, um, slip of the fingers earlier today. I thank you on behalf of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys. Everyone in their mailbox received a special thank you uh, notice. But in addition to that notice is a special tribute 
that was created by one of our, I'm proud to say, one of our past presidents, Judge Shirley M. Watts of the Court of Appeals, and Judge Melanie Sheeter, jo jo Judge Melanie Shaw Jeter. Um, and they created this special tribute and it has been included and given to everyone as part of our thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over. Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine England Caesar and I'm the recording secretary for the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys. And good afternoon. My name is Beatrice Thomas and I am the treasurer of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys and we are both uh, committee members of this book's So far in this um, program, we have been looking back at what Judge Hubbard has done and where she has brought us. We are now going to look forward to see who has become the first since she was our first first. The video that we're about to show you will show the first black female judges across the state of, um, excuse me, across the state of Maryland. You're going to see a lot of counties here represented of many women who, like Judge Hubbard, decided to accept the call to service in the judiciary. But you're also gonna notice that there are many counties that are not represented. And so we hope that you will take note of that. And as we still honor those who are first in their counties, recognize that we still have a lot of work to do.
Good afternoon. My name is Leigh Tom Dusen, and I'm the president-elect of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I unfortunately never got to meet Judge Hubbard, but because of her, myself and so many other black female attorneys can do so many things. And I've had the pleasure of appearing in front of not just one, but several black female judges that I look up to, a few that are in this room right now. And it's a beautiful thing. And I'm beyond grateful to Judge Hubbard for that. This event would not have been possible without the vision of our president, Michelle Wilson McGlon. Michelle, could you please come up? Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Michelle on recently being named a Daily Record 2021 Leadership in Law honoree. Um, also on behalf of the Alliance Executive Board and the entire Alliance membership, we'd like to thank you for your leadership during this crazy year of the pandemic and ensuring that every event, including this one, went off without a hitch. So we have a small gift for you. Thank you. There are several people I would like to thank for helping make this event a success. I would like to thank the Hubbard family. I would like to thank all of the participants in the wonderful video we saw about Judge Hubbard. I would like to thank the Courthouse and Law Museum Foundation. I would like to thank the administrative judge, chief judge, and staff of the Baltimore City Circuit Court. I would like to thank Denny Weiss for the videographer services. I would like to thank KDW Catering for the food. I would like to thank Glendora Hughes, of the one of the founding members of the Alliance for donating the funds for this year's scholarship. I would like to thank the mayor of Baltimore City, Brandon M. Scott. I would also like to thank my fellow members of the Legacy Luncheon Committee who helped plan this event. Judge Bidetta Brown, Judge Lynn Stewart Mays, Magistrate Jennifer Williams, Patricia DeMeo, Lizette Ringel Kirksey, Jasmine England Caesar, Beatrice Thomas, and Michelle Wilson McGlon. Lastly, I would like to thank Pastor P.M. Smith, member Herb Gordon, and the entire congregation of Huber Memorial Church for hosting us today. At this time, the Alliance would like to present a $500 donation to the Hope Academy in Judge Hubbard's name. Thank you so much. That concludes our event for this afternoon. Please drive safe. Thank you so much.